All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, today, I, it was a hard choice for me actually what to present because we have doing uh, also different uh, work during the pandemic and um, we have developed a, a couple of actually different methodologies. And um, uh, well, I myself a bit classified it as <laughs> I uh, partition it in, in two parts also. Uh, and the first I classified as a lesson learned. It's something that we learned uh, uh, during the 2020. And some of the open questions are also present uh, some uh, work uh, and progress that uh, uh, we are currently doing. And uh, the first work um, uh, uh, was uh, published in uh, actually last year, but was before mainly in 2020, at the end of 2020. And it, it had to do with the, the evaluation of um, uh, school and non-school related measures in the Netherlands and how we can use them to control the pandemic and to give you the um, also um, the background. So this was a part of the policy advice that uh, we provided to the outbreak management team. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, and uh, here are researchers who were involved in, uh, involved in this work. I actually did um, the analysis myself, most of the analysis myself, and the researchers are uh, from the University Medical Center Utrecht, and uh, Chris van Dorp uh, was also involved, and uh, he did a PhD in the Netherlands, but then moved to the, um, um, to, to the US. So, um, <laughs> Uh, sorry for the cut. <laughs> so just the background. So of course it was still early into the pandemic 2020 and uh, there was still a debate going on about the rule of school-based contacts in the epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2. It was not clear how uh, much exactly schools contribute to transmission and there was always a high priority to keep schools open. But um, yeah, it was not clear on the other hand, how can we achieve the control of the pandemic and prevent uh, the new pandemic waves after the first uh, after the first pandemic wave, and um, um, well, um, these are research questions that we ask ourselves, which are also based on the policy advice that we are asked to provide. Is uh, uh, what were, what are the effects of school based measures, including school school closure during the course of the pandemic? And um, if we want to keep the schools open and uh, but still have the control of the pandemic, how much do we need to reduce other contacts in the society? Um, and what is the importance of different school ages? If you, uh, if you look at these questions, I think they are very much uh, also um, agree with the questions that were asked in the first talk. Uh, and uh, perhaps we used a little bit different methodology that I will describe. So we used a transmission model won't uh, go too much into the detail um, of this model, but it's basically just a simple SEIR, age structured model. Um, the age structure is shown by this index case. Uh, we assume that there is different susceptibility of uh, individuals in different age groups. That's uh, shown here by the parameter beta K. Um, then we also implemented a few infectious stages. We assume that uh, there are infectivity in different stages is the same, and we just implement several stages to be able to reproduce uh, uh, more realistic uh, uh, infectious periods. And um, well, infected individuals can either recover or be hospitalized. So um, in the model, we have 10 age groups. Uh, we have three uh, kids categories, children category zero to four year old, five to nine and 10 to 19. And then we have age categories of 10 years. And we have um, eight hospitalization groups. So we grouped uh, all children into one age category, zero to four, five to nine and 10 to 19, because there are quite a uh, yeah, few hospitalizations in general in children. Um, and we assume that there are three broad susceptibility classes. This was also quite at the beginning of the pandemic and there were already discussions that children are probably less susceptible uh, than um, adults uh, and then elderly, but the precise estimates were not yet available. There was some initial review of some uh, initial data that could indicate that children are less susceptible. So we use three broad age categories, 0 to 19, 20, 22, uh, 59, and uh, uh, all individuals who are older than uh, 
60 years, and then we had the three infectious stages. We also used in this work uh, the contact matrices specific for the Netherlands. Uh, I think they were already also some of this methodology was uh, introduced in the first talk. They are specific to the Netherlands. Uh, Netherlands has collected data during the pandemic at certain points. Uh, um, we use the data after the first lockdown, so the contact matrix, uh, matrix after the first lockdown, which was also stratified by different, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't stratified by setting, but the schools were closed, so we know that the school contacts uh, were not included uh, in, uh, in, in that matrix. And we also had the data from before the pandemic, from 2016 and 17, from the same population. And uh, also the data, of course, uh, pre-pandemic data about the school contacts before the pandemic. And uh, I don't have a, a time to go into detail, but I think one of the things that we have done differently in this work is that um, instead of just implementing this contact matrix, as we also in the model, we estimate how these transitions happen because we know that we go from one level of contacts you know before the pandemic and then we go after the first lockdown for example we go to a different uh, contact patterns but um we don't impose for example when that transition happens you can say well when lockdown was introduced but sometimes changes in the behavioral uh in the behavior uh they happen even earlier or you know <laughs> or they happen faster so um so we estimate when the transitions happen and how fast they happen and we fit the model to do data sources which were available. Um, the first data source is an age certified hospital admissions, and we use just the data uh, from the first uh, official case during the uh, first 69 days of the pandemic. So this is roughly includes uh, the first uh, uh, wave of the pandemic. And then we used also the age certified serological data that was also collected in the Netherlands. And um, this data was also collected roughly after the first uh, wave of the pandemic. And uh, I think the first uh, thing that we learned and we confirmed ourselves that we could estimate from fitting the model to the data, we could estimate that indeed the susceptibility uh, depends on age. And for our broad age groups, we estimated that children are 23% less susceptible than uh, 60 plus year olds and then um, the middle age category is 60 percent um, uh, uh, susceptibility of 60 percent has susceptibility of 60 percent relative to the oldest age category we also learned uh, that the probability of hospitalization increases exponentially with age which you can see in this graph if you have age group and uh, uh, y-axis on the log scale so um, and um, uh, further, we uh, well after we fitted the model and we had quite some confidence that at least we can reproduce some of the past epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2, we could start looking at the interventions. So here you see the hospital admissions fitted in different age groups, which are shown in different panels, and red dots are the data. And you see that there are quite a few fewer data in uh, children, but quite a lot in um, in older individuals. And uh, we have also the confidence intervals and the black uh, solid line is the um, median, uh, uh, I think the median value of the model, the median prediction of the model, and we also reproduce the seroprevalence in different age groups. The dots are the, the, the data and um, uh, the violent shapes are the model. So, um, so after we have fit the model, so what we were asked, <laughs> we were, or the, uh, the question that we were asked to answer is uh, basically what to do with uh, schools next and why did you, the second uh, pandemic wave happened. And uh, I do not have, uh, unfortunately, I didn't include the graph with, uh, with the full schematic with the pandemic waves, but this is the schematic of how the measures were implemented and the reproduction values uh, uh, that we estimate, the effective reproduction numbers that we estimate. Uh, and so we estimate that it started, you know, was about, uh, you know, reproduction number was close to three at the start of the pandemic. Then after the first lockdown, it was reduced to below one, 2.6. And then, and, then, um, and then there was relaxation of measures in summer 2020. And after that, there was further relaxation at the end of August when schools opened. So the measures were relaxed in the rest of the society, but schools also opened. And we estimated that the reproduction number went above one. And we were asked uh, uh, if the schools were not open, for example, 
um, would, could we have prevented the second pandemic wave and specifically also what to do at this point, which was at the end of November. So I'll give you, ex I'll describe one exercise with the, could we have prevented the second pandemic wave by not opening schools and um, yeah. I, I, I don't, I won't have time to describe the second part. So just to remind that we want to have the reproduction number below one when we introduce the interventions and we just split because we don't want to model specific interventions like, I don't know, um, you know, opening shops or allowing, you know, people uh, gather in uh, outside in the restaurants in the, um, for example, uh, uh, so we don't want to model that. What we want to model is just the impact of measures on the, uh, on the no, effective number of contacts in the school environment and uh, everywhere else. And that's what we have done. And since we estimated the reproduction number using our model, what we can do as an experiment in which we decrease our contacts uh, hypothetically and uh, uh, at the end uh, of August 2020, when schools just opened and there was relaxation of other measures. And we assume that, for example, that we reduce all other contacts in the society from the level at which they were in August, until the maximum reduction that we observed after the first lockdown, because during all the pandemic, it was not possible to reduce the contacts more than uh, during the first lockdown. So we do this exercise and we start uh, with the level of contacts in August and we reduce it to the level of contacts in April 2020. And we see that the impact on the reproduction number um, uh, well, I would say it would be quite large. So in particular, if you would reduce completely all, all contacts um, uh, in until that level, so if you introduce the lockdown, the rest of society minus schools, we could re reduce the reproduction to 0 0.8. And roughly 60% reduction in contacts would be needed to reach the reproduction number of one. And on the same um, hand, if we did this uh, uh, with the school contacts, um, if we close the school, so when we reduce the contacts in schools, you can interpret this as introducing, for example, uh, partial occupancy in schools or until there are no contacts at schools, it means that the schools are closed completely. So we did the same, we go from the school, full um, uh, uh, hundred percent uh, contacts in schools until we close schools and you see that uh, the impact is much smaller in the previous case we again start with 1.3 but uh, closing schools would reduce uh, after the summer break uh, at the end of august would only reduce the reproduction number by 10 percent and in particular it would start uh, above uh, it would continue to be quite above one so uh from this we concluded that uh, while uh, you know closing schools uh, or keeping the schools closed uh, after the summer break uh, would not have prevented uh, the second wave uh, in autumn 2020 in the Netherlands. And also uh, we looked at uh, the impact of closing different types of schools or let's say breaking contacts between different age groups zero to five five-year-olds, five to 10 and 10 to 20. And this is the same exercise where you reduce these contacts from the level where they were uh, in August until a uh, full closure, so 100% reduction. And you see that, um, well, in our analysis, at least zero to five-year-olds, it almost has no impact trying to do anything with those schools. And the largest impact is still observed if you, if you, have, uh, if you reduce contacts to 10 to 20-year-olds. And um, with this, uh, I would like to finish this first part of the talk. And so uh, to summarize uh, what we learned, we learned that older school children have the largest impact on transmission. Uh, the closing schools after the summer break in August would not have prevented the second wave in autumn 2020. And uh, well, in general, uh, I don't have all the time to discuss, but in general, what we learned that the impact of measures that reduce the school-based contacts depends on the remaining opportunities to reduce non-school-based contacts. Um, uh, what it means, it means that, well, it's very important from the level with which you start. So if the pandemic is just starting, the high reproduction, uh, the reproduction number is very high. And even if you try to close the schools completely, that's pro probably not going to solve all the problems. But in the situations where you're quite close to the reproduction number of one and you need still, uh, you know, 15 or 10 percent reduction or something like that, schools could be a solution. 
And now I move on to the second part of the talk, where uh, which is uh, still uh, um, it's still not published. It's actually quite recent. We submitted on the Bad Archive a couple of days ago, and if you're interested, you can have a look. So um, uh, so this uh, this is a, and I hope that uh, it addresses some of the still open questions that uh, we are also going to discuss in this meeting. Um, the team composition was uh, largely the same, but uh, was a very important addition of people who actually conducted this work. It's uh, Timo Epam, whom I super co supervised uh, during her PhD. Now she has moved uh, uh, as a postdoc to the group of Mark Lipsic. And uh, Ilse Westerhoff, who is uh, now uh, a PhD student whom I'm called supervising, uh, she did also some data analysis uh, for this work. And we developed uh, the whole model. So how the work uh, started? So we started uh, in, uh, in roughly at the beginning uh, of uh, last year and was the modeling in March of the past year. Uh, and uh, uh, based on a, an assignment that um, uh, Patricia and Ilse got uh, from the Ministry of Education, from the Dutch Ministry of Education, to evaluate risk-based uh, antigen testing policy in uh, secondary schools. And uh, we have been conducting uh, um, evaluations of the value of this risk-based antigen testing policy and, for example, impact of vaccination in schools and so on. And uh, during this evaluation, a lot of uh, rich uh, data was collected probably not as rich as, uh, as uh, some of the data in the first talk, but still, uh, it was important uh, that allowed us to continue with this work. And so the questions that we are asking now specifically is, uh, uh, well, probably we are converging towards um, uh, endemic phase, and the question what will be the long-term projection of SARS-CoV-2 transmission in secondary schools, uh, which parameters, which epidemiological parameters drive the seasonal patterns in schools, and what is the expected burden uh, on students uh, 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 in, in future, and whether we will need any uh, control measures. And so, in brief, we constructed an agent-based model that was uh, 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 that uses data from the pilot study from the past year. So the the pilot study allowed us uh, to collect data, uh, detailed data on school characteristics and on the contact network uh, between students and teachers within and outside schools. So the pilot study was conducted between January and April 2021. Um, about 25 secondary schools, representative secondary schools in the Netherlands were invited. And um, um, uh, so uh, the evaluation uh, of risk-based antigen policy allowed us to collect data on the, on, on the cases, on the SARS-CoV-2 cases in schools and on transmission within schools. And uh, this, uh, just uh, for those who doesn't know this testing policies, if one index case is identified uh, uh, within a school, then uh, close, uh, close contacts within the same class or outside of the class within the school or even outside of the school are identified and uh, they are offered the uh, antigen testing on the same day and also offered the repeat antigen testing uh, three to five days later. And uh, students and teachers also filled in uh, detailed questionnaires about their contacts contacts. And so in the school, uh, in the model, we have a, a, a school with um, 900, roughly 50 students and 72 teachers. Um, one day is divided into three different periods where we have within school contacts. And um, uh, it's the first eight hours, and then the next eight hours, it's outside the school related contacts. And also, there can be outside school and related contacts, so import importations basically into the school. And the last eight hours is, uh, is just night, so when there are no contacts. So, uh, for those who are interested, the definition of the contact is a, uh, is a conversation of about of more than 15 minutes within one and a half meter distance or a physical touch. And so we collected uh, basically data about um, uh, contact network of students within schools. So how many contacts they have within their own class or with, uh, uh, or with uh, uh, students from other grades within the class. So we also collected data within, uh, uh, on within school contacts between teachers and students. And uh, finally, we also had information about school related contacts outside school because uh, students uh, meet each other outside of school and in the model, we have uh, a few contacts outside school. Um, 
So one student, for example, meets on average two other students outside of school and teachers uh, did not report to have any contacts uh, with each other outside of schools. We also use a, a constant importation rate into the schools uh, in our simulations. So the transmission model is, um, is quite simple. So um, basically also the, the, uh, the students and teachers can be susceptible or vaccinated. And then they develop, uh, if they're infected, they can develop either symptomatic or asymptomatic infection, and then they recover. And importantly here, the immunity waning is also um, is already important. So recovered individuals uh, uh, can lose the immunity and they become susceptible again uh, to infection. Uh, the transmission, we implement direct uh, transmission of susceptible individuals uh, due to direct contact, but we also implemented a kind of aerosol transmission where um, susceptible students and teachers uh, can be infected within the same class uh, during uh, super spreading events, which are quite rare and occur in approximately, I think, 10% of 10% um, of different um, of all transmission events. And we start with the dynamics of the Omicron variant and we uh, uh, implemented, uh, we use certain assumptions about uh, what the epidemiological characteristics of the Omicron are. In particular, it's, uh, um, it it's, uh, has a high transmissibility, 40-60% with respect to the Delta variant, uh, shorter incubation period, um, if I'm not mistaken, 60% reduction with respect to the wild type. And it has, a, of course, a high degree of uh, immune escape uh, uh, after vaccination, implemented as a reduction in susceptibility against the, in, uh, sorry, reduction in the vaccine efficacy um, in reducing susceptibility against infection. And um, uh, so uh, we also implement the seasonality. So we define winter in some periods when the reproduction number, during the winter period, the reproduction number is higher and during the summer period, it's lower. So um, the waning of immunity, uh, just in, uh, in brief, uh, immunity, sterilizing immunity wanes and we assume in the baseline, at baseline that the uh, average uh, duration of sterilizing immunity is nine months. And um, uh, after that, people uh, uh, return to the 75% of the original susceptibility. And they are also less symptomatic after, uh, so there is a decrease in probability of symptomatic infections after each reinfection. So at I'm baseline- Sorry, Gana, sorry. Um, Gana, just to say you've got about a, a minute, two minutes left. Okay, well, I'll move on. So here it's, um, uh, this, these are the patterns that we, repro uh, that we predict will occur in the next uh, 30 months. So this is the first uh, Omicron wave, and then we see that there will be quite a, um, uh, uh, large outbreaks in autumn period and smaller outbreaks in winter period. So this shaded area show the winter, uh, winter times and this is summer times. So we predict uh, seasonal outbreaks in autumn, larger seasonal outbreaks in autumn. But overall, based on our assumptions, uh, the burden is not so high. We don't introduce any other variants, et cetera. Uh, so the number of uh, the prevalence of symptomatic students would be about 2.9% only uh, of total number of students would be larger, but the symptomatic 2.9%. We also um, explored what is the importance of uh, different uh, epidemiological parameters on the patterns, um, on the seasonal patterns. And the, by far the most important one is, uh, uh, is the immunity waning. So depending on how fast the immunity wanes, you can, you know, if it wanes very fast, even after three months, you could get even more outbreak. So you could have like a high, uh, uh, an outbreak in uh, autumn, but then also another outbreak um, in, uh, in uh, spring. <laughs> And uh, we looked at different interventions uh, that could be useful. And in short, because I don't have time, so we, uh, we evaluated the regular screening, regular weekly uh, screening twice a week, annual booster vaccination, and also class quarantine. Uh, so quarantine of close contacts and uh, the most uh, uh, the, the the interventions that reduce the health burden the most are the annual booster vaccination and screening. Uh, 
And so this is a reduction in number of symptomatic student days, uh, which is the highest. And they also have, these two interventions also have, uh, have the higher cost benefits. So they prevent most infections and uh, with uh, least students absent. And um, with this, I would like to, to finish. So um, the second part, so we uh, predict, or well, the model predicts that uh, uh, we will uh, have seasonal patterns with dominant autumn outbreaks and smaller winter outbreaks. Um, the prevalence of symptomatic infections, 2.9%. Duration of sterilizing immunity is the key parameter to understand these patterns. And uh, screening and annual booster vaccination uh, are uh, the interventions that could be useful in future to control infections in schools. Uh, thanks. So I'd like to answer questions, or if you have time, or if not, then. Um, great. Thanks, Scanner. Um, so that I think there's one question from Jasmina in the chat, um, but can I suggest that maybe you can answer I that really in the chat? So and the result, older children contribute more to infections is that because of modeling increased social mixing, it has larger class size in secondary schools, or do you take into account their vaccination status and modeled efficacy? of it, which would mitigate this. So, um, well, uh, our conclusion was based on when vaccination of the uh, uh, high importance of secondary schools was for the pre-vaccination period. And it, indeed, it, it's based on that these students have more contacts. So in zero to five year olds, at least from the contact matrices that we have, uh, uh, for example, students or, or children in general, they have a smaller number of contacts and also the primary schools report smaller number of contacts than secondary schools. That's why um, um, in our analysis, we assume the same susceptibility within all children, zero to 20 year olds, but because uh, they have higher number of contacts, they basically also contribute more to transmission. And very interesting extension to regarding after vaccination, but maybe we can discuss this uh, during open questions. Because <laughs> I would have to think what the interpretation would be later. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, then feel free to put it in the chat, and I'm sure we can either come back to them later or Gannick and um, write a response in the, ch in the chat. Um,